are getting those services for our vulnerable communities here in Wirral. So Cabinet, um, can I ask you to agree the recommendation on page 56 to note the report and endorse the recommendation of the Community Pharmacy Scrutiny Review. Thank you very Thank you, Phil. Thank you very much indeed for coming today. We'll move on now and Phil will come back in and chair us from here. Yeah. So, on to item 8, um, which is the Mersey Region Adoption Agency Report. Um, in the absence of Tony Smith, I'm just going to kind of introduce this uh, to say that this is a proposal to move to a, a, a kind of regional footprint for um, adoption services um, based on a Merseyside wide approach, um, in incorporating those in Wirral, Sefton, and Liverpool in, um, uh, in the, the cluster of, of agencies. It sets out in the report the uh, advantages um, of moving to that uh, kind of model. Government are encouraging uh, areas to do this. Um, there, is, there is some funding that's been made available. So, the proposal, I'm just going to ask you really to turn to the recommendations on page 92, uh, which asks us to uh, note, obviously approve the continued development of the model for um, the regional adoption agency uh, and recommendations that um, local authority staff members be seconded into this um, uh, agency. And secondly, note the intention for the new model to move into shadow form the second quarter of 2017, uh, with the new model becoming operative from January of next year, um, proving the name, adoption in Merseyside as the brand uh, going forward, and uh, asking for a further report containing a detailed business case, um, which will be obviously consulted with uh, staff and unions. Uh, and will come back to us in, in due course. So, in essence, that's what we're being asked to support. Can we, can we agree those recommendations? Please. Agreed? Okay, thank you. Okay, now, clearly we've got a number of reports on this agenda which are around very um, important areas of, of transformation work. And, and as I've said many times, uh, a cabinet and council um, uh, changing the way we do business uh, and looking at new models of delivery is going to be a key element uh, for this council going forward and will enable us to uh, sustain services given the massive cuts from government that we're, that we're facing and, and this report item 9 is the first of these reports on this agenda today so um, it, it is a really important report. Um, I'm going to ask Chris Jones, the cabinet member, to talk to it in a second, but um, I'm going to ask Paddy Cleary from Unison, who's indicated he'd like to address cabinet, if he would just um, say a few words. So, welcome, <coughs> Paddy. Over, over to you. Thanks, Jay. So, happy to address cabinet today on behalf of our members of Little Unison. Let me be clear from the start we did not find ourselves under continued attack on our public service, services from this austerity mad. Tory government, some of these decisions would not need to be taken. The reduction of our grant funding will see us ultimately being self reliant on the income we generate and the funds we collect. That does not excuse in any way, shape, or form the way we at Unison, I'm sure our colleagues at United, feel about how, in some instances, we have been involved in these reports to date. How our members have been communicated with, and what, if any, information has been shared with us. We have, up until this cabinet agenda, had a wonderful relationship with the leadership throughout these challenging times. We have not always agreed on everything, but we have continually found resolutions to some difficult decisions. We have 
last and being promised that meetings with the leadership, involvement upstream, with any alternative provision of services, with ethical elements pursued in any council contracts. I am disappointed to say that it has not been the case with items on this agenda. I am disappointed that under the Labour administration this is not the case. I am disappointed that a party we affiliate to does not give us the trade unions the same opportunities allowed to consultants and outside agencies whose ultimate agenda does not put the best interests of all members and the world residents first. I find it insulting that consultants can address the full Labour group and share information and we are prevented from doing so. I find it insulting that the amount of public funds are wasted on consultants to tell us the colour of a big red bus. I find it insulting that managers, staff and trade unions are not involved in scrutiny groups that could well see some of these reports that officer-led and consultant-led have not seen the light of day. The first of these reports is on integration. Unison is not opposed to the concept of integration. What we do have, though, is concerns about the terms and conditions that our members are actually transferring across the trust on. Time and again, the latest being only last week, when the Chamber of Commerce have point blankly refused to recognise trade unions, we find the battle to defend our terms and conditions of our members ongoing. This is a Labour Council that should honour these terms that have been negotiated before, for long before my time. We are pleased that members transferring the trust will remain members of the Mayside Pension Fund. We have concerns though that two-tiered workforce and the problems associated with that could well create division between colleagues. We also have major concerns about future pay rises for our members. Staff have suffered a real-time pay cut since 2010 due to this government of up to 15%. And it is vital that our members remain part of the national negotiating framework for all future pay rises. This should form part of the contract, and as the leadership is fully aware, we have continu continually asked for an ethical element to be attached <coughs> to any contract the council procures. That would also protect the terms and conditions of our staff. Protection of social care professionals and ethos integrity of the social care model framework still gives us cause for concern. We have concerns about how staff will be professionally regulated, protected, valued and also represented going forward. We still believe that future meaningful consultation needs to take place on this area and these issues and we request a delay in the implementation date until satisfactory resolutions are found. Thanks for Before I bring Chris in, can, can I just kind of respond to a few of his comments? I mean, I, I um, share Paddy's comments about the importance of having a constructive relationship with trade unions. I, I personally think we do. Um, we, we meet with Paddy and his colleagues on a monthly basis as a leadership. There are meetings in between with, with officers. And all I would say is my, my door is always open, um, Paddy, and I'm giving you that offer and, and, and the offer of the other trade unions, because it is, it is in nobody's interest for us to be at loggerheads over these important issues. Um, I recognise it. Some of, these, some of these issues are difficult. Uh, we are facing a massive cut in our budget from the government. Um, so we are going to have to make some difficult decisions. But my priority as leader of the council throughout all of this is to protect jobs as far as we can. Where possible, we will want to protect terms and conditions. That might not be possible on every, uh, every occasion. But we are trying as far as we can to keep these vital services going. Um, and that's why we're embarking on this transformation program. Because staying as we are, it, as far as I'm concerned, is not an option. We will simply run out of money. That's the reality that we're facing. And we know that the government is cutting off all support from local authorities from 2021 when the revenue support grant goes. So we will be on our own. So we've got to come up with a more sustainable model of delivering services. And I want to work with our trade union colleagues and our staff to ensure that um, we, uh, we can uh, retain those vital frontline services. And that's a commitment that I, I am uh, prepared to re reiterate this morning. Um, so I just want to make those opening comments. But um, Chris, could, could, can you just talk to this report, please? Thanks, Phil. Um, we, we know that social care services play an important role in enabling vulnerable people to maintain independence and to keep well in middle, which falls in with, with a number of our pledges. But the cost of adult social care is significant and it doesn't operate in isolation. And we do know that this 
government is absolutely underfunding social care across the board. The interdependency between health and care systems has been become increasingly clear over the recent years, and um, the media has been absolutely full of, of the different ways that different areas are working to try and do something about it. Nationally, we know that councils are faced with increasing demand on social care services, which presents as a huge challenge to meet within the, the small amount of available resources we have. Local authorities and NHS providers are increasingly working to integrate social care and health services locally to provide both sustainability and a better experience for people who use those services. This is one of the biggest transformation projects we've undertaken as a council and I know Anne is going to comment after on that aspect. So the key proposal in this report is to fully integrate the statutory frontline assessment and support planning process in order to contribute to meeting the challenges of growth and demand and to provide an improved service for local <coughs> residents. This does involve the transfer of social care staff to the NHS on the 1st of June 2017 in order to provide a disjoint and seamless health and care delivery service for older people and for adults. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed really in, in Paddy's comments because I think we've done absolutely everything we can to keep um, the people who are too keen over in the Merseyside Pension Fund. Um, but Phil is saying that, you know, he's, he's always open to, to talking. Um, in addition, the further proposal is to create an integrated commissioner for health and care on the role. This will enable services to be commissioned through a single organisation filling the statutory health and care functions of the Council and the Clinical Commissioning Group. It will also enable strategic outcomes to be effectively delivered through a single planning framework and structure, and the Single Commissioner Initiative will enable the health and care system to use Wibble's resources together to jointly create a sustainable health and care system. This report sets out key aspects of the integration programme, which is focused on improving outcomes for residents, with the aim of delivering the right care in the right place at the right time and telling their story once. I'd like to thank the council and CCG officers who have worked so hard to get this far. It's taken a, lot of, a long time to get to this point. Um, and just to let Cabinet know that the, the board of the CCG last week passed this um, paper. I can't recommend a delay because I think it's absolutely vital that, that we go ahead with, with the two pianist staff on the 1st of June. And there are nine recommendations on page 105 of the report, um, which I won't read individually, but I'd be very grateful if, if Cabinet would agree those recommendations. Okay, uh, I think Anne, you want to say, say a few words? Yeah. Yes, Thanks, Chair. Yes, on, on the, uh, the, the sort of wider transformation of this in terms of bringing everything together, this report really is the first phase of a longer term plan to bring not, not only the teams together, which Chris has described, working across social care, but also the budgets that support them. So today, as you've said, is the agreement on frontline staff in terms of assessment of need and support the planning processes to manage the demand and growth that we've got going forward. So this brings together the staffing from the council and the community trust to deliver those services for older people and adults. Um, it's a proposal that hits a number of our key pledges under our plan, namely older people live well, people with dis disabilities live independently and residents live healthier lives. Um, the savings are set out at 9.3, as you've said, Chris, of the report under this first phase. And they're projected, the savings are projected to be in the region of £11.5 million. Pound. That's savings from rising demographic demand, inflation, and reducing our costs. So it's 4.3 million, 4.8 million, and 2.4 million, which makes up the 11.5 uh, 11 million. Um, what I really want to talk about is the second phase of this, which is the further development around the single integrated commissioner uh, and a commissioning hub for Wirral. And this is going to be the subject of full business case uh, development process now, which will come back to Cabinet in September. 
uh, and updates on the development of that will be reported regularly into the Transformation uh, Portfolio Board as the due diligence along the road progresses here. Clearly, um, there's a need on bringing together and pooling budgets, budgets for Cabinet to be assured that all the risks associated with this are considered and mitigated uh, in order that the aims of the hub are achievable both by, the, both, by both organisations but particularly around the financials and the government's arrangements for the, from the Council's point of view. So um, finally as set out at 6.2, the, the project aims to ensure, as you've said Chris, right care, right place, right time and reduce the growth burden on the Council's net revenue by more joined up working, managing demand and the cost of social care. But the Council will retain a robust accountability and governance framework through a formal contractual arrangement with the Wirral Community Foundation Trust and the performance of that will be monitored to ensure contract compliance and delivery of outcomes. Um, I just want to say also something that uh, as both yourself Phil and Chris have said uh, about the comments made by Paddy, this, this um, is, is a transformation project which should have been coming on stream on the 1st of April. We've actually delayed that to the 1st of June. So we've already delayed this process to, to allow for ongoing negotiations which were around terms and conditions of service and particularly around pension arrangements. Now it would be easy for us, given our financial position as a council, to say um, well all of these staff who are transferring uh, in together now go over onto NHS pension schemes. But the fact of the matter is that the NHS pension scheme is not as good as the Merseyside pension fund scheme, the local government pension fund scheme as it is. And uh, therefore we've allowed extra time for that negotiation to take place for us to look at what those uh, differences in costing will be. And we are taking a hit on that. We are going to pay more money to enable our staff to transfer over uh, to be over on their current terms and conditions, including their pension and not just a broadly comparable pension scheme. So they are going over with all of the, uh, those um, principles intact. Um, so, you know, we, we do have some principles around fairness when we're looking at transfers and when we're looking at alternative delivery models. We know we're a living wage employer. We've got some social and ethical principles that we, we apply uh, in terms of looking at these processes. And I think in this one we have done it and we've done it fairly as well. Um, we can't guarantee what's going to happen into the future. We will try on every negotiation we enter into to ensure that we get those terms and conditions to remain as stable as possible for as long into the future as we can. But when we're transferring into different types of organisation, we can't dictate to them, you know, year, light years ahead. We can hopefully get for as long as we can, a year or two, maybe five years. I don't want to be prescriptive because every negotiation will be, will be different. But, you know, I want to give some assurance also that we're doing our level best to ensure that we protect uh, jobs into the future. We're all jobs, you know, our, our staff's jobs into the future. So that's all I want to say. Thank you, Phil. And just a couple of more points for me to add. I mean, again, I, I, I'm surprised to hear Paddy's comments about trade unions not feeling um, properly engaged. I mean, paragraph 4.3 actually states engagement with trade unions has been held throughout the programme. Uh, and that's certainly the instruction that we've given the, the officers that, that trade unions need to be involved throughout uh, this process. And, and I, I believe that they, they have. Uh, so I'm surprised by that. But also, can I say, you know, as well as all the, the, the you know, the financial um, uh, benefits which, which Anne and, and Chris have, have talked about, um, i just ask uh, members to look at paragraph uh, 3.1, uh, section 3, which talks about desired outcomes and benefits of integrated health and social care. So this is about, you know, the phrase delivering the right care and the right the place at the right time. This is about social care and health staff working within one organisation to streamline assessment processes, reduce duplication of uh, multiple professional involvements. I, I'm sure members like me have had lots of examples over the years of uh, residents who, who feel worn down by the fact they have to tell their the, the story several times to different professionals from council to NHS. It, if this is going to address that key issue, I think that's going to be a huge move forward in terms of the service we provide 
to our most vulnerable residents. So, I mean, I, I do think this, is, this will make the service better, will improve the, the service. So, um, I, th I think it's something we should get behind. So, with, with those comments, uh, we've, Chris has moved recommendations on page 105. Are they seconded? Yeah, okay. So, can, can, can we agree those recommendations? Are they agreed? Okay, thanks very much. Okay, that takes us on to item 10, which is the 27 to 18 residential and nursing provider fees. So, Chris, this is you again. Thanks, Phil. Uh, this is the annual report uh, we bring, uh, and the paper covers proposals for new fee rates for our social care in uh, Proposals have been made in the context of significant financial pressures for the council and for providers who have really had difficulty in, in the last year. So it covers all sectors, so it covers residential and nursing, domiciliary care and supported living. But it's critically important that care is delivered in a way that puts the person again at the centre of how it's delivered and that they're respected and treated with dignity at all times. And that's why we must commission a sustainable care market within the care act requirements with a quality of care that reflects our local expectations. To this end, the officers of the council have worked collaboratively to benchmark, consult and engage with the care sector to develop care fees that will support a sustainable market and to enable staff to be paid the, the national living wage. The cost of the increases is three million pounds, which represents a significant investment at this time that will support the sector at a very challenging time for them and for us. Um, and table 4.1 shows that the recommended new rates and table 3.2 shows the cost to the council. The recommendations uh, for Cabinet this morning are that Cabinet approve the rates and fees recommended by officers within it. The Cabinet recommend to Council that the increased cost of 2.9 million be met by the social care precept element of the Council tax. The Cabinet approved to uplift fees to providers from the 1st of April this year, to approve the forward work plan to work in collaboration with the Liverpool City Region and the supported living sector to pilot, test and phase in a sustainable new model of care, and to approve the forward work plan to work with partner organisations and the independent sector to develop a new model of step-up and step-down bed-based provision. Okay, so um, unless there are any other comments, can we can we agree those recommendations? They agree. Okay, thank you. Which takes us on to item eleven, which leisure and cultural services um, future provision of services. So again, Paddy, you you asked to speak to us on this item, so.
just for a further 136,000 in order for a consultant to tell us the time clock on our watch. Once again, it's not the first time we've been here. There have been several reports as the various strands associated within this area at significant cost to Willow residents. The timetable is that optimistic, it seems it's already a done deal. Onto the actual report itself that looks at the re-imaging of leisure and cultural services. Clear steer has been given here in the executive summary. Financial aspects and access to finance set a clear agenda. But I believe that they need to be challenged. The consistent message is about savings that can be made through the bad status. It's a very risky strategy given this current government. Does the new organisation automatically qualify for that exemption as a non-profit organisation say for £1 million a year? I don't believe that's an automatic entitlement. I don't believe that's guaranteed. Why have we not challenged the HMRC about the bad state of all leisure services, like Ealing and Borough Council have, and show that this exemption is possible within a public body? A lack of access to grants and other funding streams is mentioned in this report. Give me examples, give the public examples, and give all members of staff examples. I have asked for these consistently, and none have been forthcoming from people who pay only the bad example. I have examples that we haven't pursued. Why have we not tapped into the FA or Sports England and presented cases, for example, on the playing field strategy? Why have we sat on this application? The report goes on to say about pricing to market and that is a key element. Do we charge the correct amount or do we sell ourselves short? There are clear examples that we sell ourselves short. <coughs> I can list plenty of these examples. That's because our staff who have constantly hit a brick wall of recommendations or ideas for income generation. The report states work with other agencies and partners alike, yet the Chamber of Commerce tweets about using pure gyms and not our own provision. Baffling is not the word. We have, invested, we have invested in areas and seen gains associated with that. We should and still can generate capital receipts and transform the whole package on offer. Serious decisions need to be made in order to utilise capital receipts in this way, given the time still constraints from this government. But you as elected members need to make these, rather than take the easy option and put these services into any form of our plans company. They should be the lifeblood of our communities with social inclusion a priority, priced accordingly and staffed with a dedicated provision we currently have. We need to keep these services in house and utilise the expertise we have to generate more income for our services and the residents of Riddle. Thanks. Thank
staff. I've been asked to work flexibly for a long, long time now. They've took it on board. They've trained up in different areas. We've got lifeguards training to work on reception, vice versa. The staff have took cut after cut after cut. The workforce has been reduced. They've been asked to do more and more as the years go by. And they've continued to do that. In this report, it mentions about being more commercial. We've had staff coming on board who are more commercially minded. We had a, lot, a, a leisure operations manager employed last year who's doing a good job. We're bringing in income. We've got income streams that we have recommended to BWP to be looked at. These income streams don't seem to be taken on board, as we mentioned before, to Sport England. There's, there's other options that are baffling us that aren't being looked at. The VAT seems to be the only plus that goes into this pamphlet. We don't believe that that should be the case. If we're talking on £284,000 for a consultancy, take that off the VAT, it's not a million pounds. We're making strides into more income streams now. Our invigorate has increased doubled over the past couple of years. We've invested in the gymnasiums, in West Kirby Concourse, in Guinea Gap down the road. We believe that more investments will bring more income. If you look at the Woodchurch Estate, we've got a, a, a community centre and a swimming pool on Woodchurch Estate. If you look around that estate, there's 12,000 residents or more now on that estate. You've got the Beechwood Estate, you've got the Nocturne Estate, and you've got Prenton surrounding it. We've got one competitor that's on the daily estate there, Total Furnace. We should be investing in the Wood Church, improving that and put a gymnasium in there and improving that facility for all the people around to take advantage of that. And we've been inclusive with social inclusion, we've got pensioners, we've got young teenagers, all age groups, disabilities, all using our leisure centres. You go around now into these leisure centres this morning, if you were to visit any leisure centre now, you would get every walk of life in there. We've got pensioners. On the, you've all seen the tell, you've all seen the adverts of the pensioners staying out the window as well. We? Not here, not in the world. They're all in the gymnasiums now. They're all in the little clubs. They're having a cup of tea after they've been to the gym. And this is what we want for the future. Don't give it away now. We're nearly there. The staff have invested. The, the leisure managers have invested in these leisure centres. The parks, the parks lads have been working tirelessly, they're overstretched. We haven't seen much difference in the parks and, and the countryside because these lads have been doing such a good job over the years. They've been restructured, they took everything on board, they took pay cuts and they're still working tirelessly to make it. And, and what we don't want to do is give it away now. Don't waste this opportunity now. The outcomes for the public and the people of Wirral is beneficial for this service, these services, to stay in house. They should stay in house. Don't waste this opportunity now. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alan. Um, Anne. Delivery model we will have in the future 
are predicted to be in the region of £4 million. That's in realigned charging, VAT has been, as has been mentioned, and different management approaches and improvements. The first phase of the work, the report has been based on a review of financial and operational data on the services and about needs across Wirral. Workshops, interviews, input, input from council services and agencies to develop a concept of how what is described as reimagined group of services might look in terms of using the assets differently to deliver social and economic outcomes which fit with our pledges particularly around leisure and cultural opportunities for all and to develop new income streams to support those services and thus enable financial support from the council to be reduced. Chair, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to point out that in proposing that we move ahead to phase two of, the, of this work to develop the concept further and in detail to produce a full business case together with financial projections, business plan, uh, detailed governance transition <coughs> arrangements and um, you know, tra transition plans, we'll focus on three areas. Now, I'd, I'd like to pick up here where, where Paddy came in and, and Alan, because they both mentioned the in-house option being ruled out. Well, in actual fact, as you will have seen from your report, uh, BWB at 1.8 of the report do, in fact, uh, suggest that in-house option would not be viable. But we have put the in-house option back in to go forward now to outline business and full business case because there's a number of reasons for that. The scale of the service that we're talking about here, the way that it affects residents across the borough, the number of staff involved, we want that in-house option examined very thoroughly. So there's no question of that having been ruled out. Uh, what has been ruled out is a local authority traded company which would not have the flexibility to, um, to be able to deal with this big basket of services given the, the amount of uh, money involved. And we've also ruled out a private option and that is giving it over to a private company just to run those services. That does not fit with our social ethos and the way that we uh, believe in protecting as many jobs as we can and in our, uh, you know, our own values. So we've ruled those two out, but we haven't ruled out in-house, we haven't ruled out a charitable trust or a community interest company to be looked at. So I want to make that absolutely clear to everybody here that the in-house option will be uh, thoroughly examined as we go, as we go forward. Um, just on some of the things that, um, that, that Paddy's raised, it, you, you, you opened up Paddy by, by suggesting that we were on a very tight timetable. We are on a very tight timetable, given the financial imperative here. And you know, we wouldn't be doing any of this, it's been said before, if we weren't under this government's austerity uh, programme, which we've been under for five years. So five years we've been under this, lost 155 million, another 132 million to go at, 45 of that in this year. I mean, these are telephone you know, numbers. These are big numbers and we have got to move quickly on this. But that doesn't mean that we're going to sacrifice rigour for expediency in this process because we won't. What we will do is ensure that each of those options is thoroughly examined. And, you know, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry to hear you say you haven't had information and data shared with you and, and we're only hearing that today. I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that because we've been very clear from the outset that we wanted the unions to be as engaged as they could be at whatever, whatever stage of the process we were at. So, um, you know, I'm quite astonished to hear that. Um, I'd also like to say a little bit about BWB because BWB are um, a, an organisation that have a strong social and ethical brand and they develop social impact models and they've got some good experience of this around the country and particularly, particularly they've gone through a, a, a procurement process but we selected them because of, partly because of their, you know, their, their background in doing this type of work and doing it well and ensuring that we do have, you know, those social principles enshrined in, in the, whatever model it is going forward. And the, as I've said, you know, the prediction is that we're going to, even, even at the first phase here, before they've even done any detailed business work, 
They are seeing four million pound, easily seeing four million pounds worth of savings. Well, we've got to look at that, and we've got to say we need to be able to, you know, to engage with them. Look at what we're paying for them as consultants, and look at that on a cost-benefit analysis basis in terms of what we're paying. Appreciate what's been said about there's been reports before on leisure. There has, there have been reports, and they haven't gone anywhere, have they? V4 and other pieces of work. We have given all of that to BWB and told them to incorporate the findings from those reports into this piece of work going forward. We've made every piece of research that's been drawn available to them in, to ensure that they, they have as much groundwork information going forward. But I want to assure people that there will be a full consultation uh, in, in, uh, process going forward. There's going to be pre-decision scrutiny. There's going to be the outline business case. There'll be task and finish work if we need it to fully explore uh, those options going forward. So, Chair, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm confident here. I feel very confident that by Cabinet endorsing this first phase of the work, and asking you to give approval to the second phase of the work, that what we're going to have is, is a, a service coming forward. All of those really valued services, as I said at the outset, which will be um, accessible to people across Wirral going forward in a cost envelope that we can afford. And just to say, many other authorities around the country have just divested themselves because of their financial position. They've just got rid of these services and let them go to privatisation. We are doing our level best to take a different approach, a different view, one that protects jobs and one that gives good services to the people who are going forward. Thanks, Okay, thanks, thanks Anne. Um, right, okay, so I'm going to ask you to look at the recommendations on page 154. Um, which, which Anne have, has moved. Okay? Uh, just to so ask Kevin, can we agree those recommendations? Agreed. Are they agreed? Okay, thanks very much. <coughs> right, uh, that takes us then to uh, our item 12, which is our third uh, important kind of transformation um, piece of work, Access Wirral. Um, I'm going to ask Matt, Matthew Patrick to introduce his report. Oh, sorry, before he does that, Penny, I know you've indicated you want to speak to this as well. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Matthew. Thanks again, Chair. Um, we have never buried our head in the sand as trade unions given the difficulties this council's face. Again, with the austerity led agenda from this government. This report is asking for approval for a £1.2 million investment over and above the £860,000 already committed that would look to save £3 million in two years' time. So in effect, a net save of down from 40 k Unless, of course, we have any add-ons or further costs, and that's never happened before, has it? What is not in the report is the 50% reduction in staff from 199 full-time equivalents to 100 full-time equivalents. What is also not clear is what reduction will occur in the one-stop shop provision and access points found in our libraries from the BWB report. The 2020 pledge of looking after the most vulnerable in our society is then brought into question. As branch secretary and accountable to the members who elect me, I, can't allow that I cannot allow this to happen without challenging the reduction in staff in numbers. This potential reduction in our one-stop shop provision and the life reduction in access points in our libraries, I, sim I simply would not be doing my duty if I didn't. The staffing reduction will affect the livelihood of staff.